praise the Lord. Well, uh, brothers and sisters all over the world, I welcome you to the final session of yesterday's conference. Um, the Midnight Now End Time Prophecy uh, Conference and Book Talk. We were not able to finish the third session. Uh, we were not able to go ahead with the third session because of time. And so I have decided to do this teaching as a separate um, online uh, event. So uh, without wasting much time, let us go into the teaching. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time in your presence. We pray, O oh Lord, that you will take control. Open the eyes of your children, O oh Lord. Touch their hearts. Open their eyes, cause them to awaken from their slumber. Cause them to know that the time of your coming is nigh. And grant them grace to take the steps that are necessary to be ready. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, today's topic is the two antichrists. The man of sin, also known as the false prophet, and the wicked one, also known as the beast. The wicked one is also known as the seed of the serpent. Uh, watching the thrones of the kingdoms of iron and clay, according to the mandate of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. So, this is the topic for the teaching, this session. Uh, as an introduction of myself, the Lord called me in 2011, and at the time I was a school administrator. I uh, studied chemical engineering in the University of Lagos. Uh, the Lord, when He called me, He said to me, Tell my people to get ready that I'm coming soon. And then He told me, Write a book. When the book is finished, your ministry will start. The process of writing that book was the school that the Lord took me to to open my eyes to the things that He wanted me and His body to know at this time. Now, Are we supposed to see the Antichrist before the rapture? Because this is a question that we must all ask ourselves because uh, if, we, if there is no scriptural evidence or backing, something saying from the word of God that we are supposed to see these people before the rapture, then what is the essence of looking out for them? But if there is a scripture that says that we, we, the final generation that will be alive at the time of the rapture will see the final world leaders, if such a scripture exists, then indeed it is something that should be taken most seriously. And we are going to examine some scriptures to know whether we have a basis for this teaching, whether we have uh, what is called a local study, okay? We have a, do, do we have a, the grounds to even begin to talk about this? Okay, watching for the man of sin or watching for the wicked one or the beast. And if we see in scripture that there is a basis for it, then I think we should take it very seriously, and the things that we are going to, uh, that are going to be revealed in the course of these teachings, should indeed be taken very seriously. Okay, these are the books, uh, Midnight Now, Volume 1 and 2, written and published, even as the Lord commanded me. Now, I want to say something about the call when God calls somebody into the position of a watchman. Now, I believe that the Lord 
from what I have told you that he told me to tell these people to get ready, that he is coming soon. So he has called me into the position of a watchman, but the truth is that as an individual, as a human being, I have my flaws. I sometimes have a lot of my enthusiasm and, uh, to get the better of me, and sometimes the, uh, the grace of God has I've been blessed to have the grace of God call me back to order in some situations. So, what we need to do as human beings that have the Spirit of God is um, we cannot look on our weaknesses and hold them responsible for our inactivity or refusal to do what the Lord has called us to do. So whether you are walking and you stumble, when you stumble, you rise, get up, and continue on the journey. So what I'm here to do um, is not to tell you uh, to come to show that I know something that you do you don't know. Uh, I'm here to reach to tell you to watch with me because the Lord has commanded all of us to watch. Jesus said in, to uh, his disciples, he said, what I say to you, I say to all, watch. This is the command of Jesus Christ to his church that we should watch. And um, as in the Bible, many people that God used were not perfect people, maybe had their flaws. So I urge you to join me as we forge ahead in this teaching and as we watch for the coming of the Lord and uh, warning the body of Christ and the world of what is coming. There is a saying that if you see something, you say something. If you see something, say something, okay? You report suspicious activity. You see some of these signs in certain parts of uh, uh, different states of uh, the United States. Okay, so the same thing applies to us as believers. If the Lord has touched you and opened your eyes to see something, there is the responsibility upon you to say something. And sometimes, we see, like in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 12, it says, For now we see through a, da a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, even as also I am known. Uh, the book of Mark, chapter 8, verse 22, um, there was an account where Jesus came to Bethsaida and they brought a blind man to him and asked him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the town, and he spat on his eyes, put his hands upon him, and asked him if he saw anything. And then the man said, looked up and said, I see men walking as three trees. So sometimes watchmen, when they see things, when they are yet a distance away, they may appear blurred. Now, when Jesus touched that man the second time, he began to see clearly. So, all this is laying the foundation for us to know that in this teaching, I'm not saying that this is so or this is so. All, what I'm saying is, let us watch together as the body of Christ, as commanded by our Lord Jesus Christ. And you, on your own, come to your own personal conclusion about the things you will see and hear in this teaching. Now, why is this topic important? Out of all the signs of the end times given in the New Testament, the ones that will indicate the imminence of the return of Jesus Christ for his church are the appearing of the man of sin and the wicked one on the world stage, according to the context of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 1 to 10. We need to know where to look and what to look out for in order to be able to say for sure that we have identified the man of sin or the wicked one or both of them. 
It is very possible that as we speak, the man of sin, that is also known as the false prophets and the wicked one, also known as the beast, may have been revealed already. And if this is the case, then indeed things are critical. We should waste no time in repenting of our unwatchfulness and unpreparedness and seeking the Lord in prayer and fasting. It is dangerous to be asleep at a time like this. And unfortunately, and unfortunately to remain foolish by not taking steps to ensure our preparedness. Now we see that the Lord has made provision for his people not to be in darkness when that time comes. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 4 to 6 says, But ye, ye brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. That word sober means to be wise and discreet. Let us watch and be wise. So, this is a scripture telling us that as believers, God will not leave us in darkness. Now the Bible says that that day, it says like a snare shall that day come upon them that dwell upon the face of the earth. Like a snare. In other words, it's going to take earth dwellers by surprise. But children of God are not supposed to be earth dwellers. That is, they are not supposed to be walking in the, in the flesh. We are supposed to be walking in the spirit. We are not supposed to be sucked in by the hustles and, and bustles of, of this world. Okay, we are supposed to be constantly aware of our identity as pilgrims. As pilgrims, knowing that we are passing through this world on a journey to the day that we will meet our Lord, when he will appear to take us. And that we have an assignment to make sure that our garments are white as we go, as we wait for that day. Make sure that our garments are white and make sure that we are busy doing what the Lord has commanded us to do, which is to publish his kingdom abroad. Hallelujah. Now let us take a look at the foundational scripture in this teaching. I have been talking about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 8 for uh, some minutes now. And now let us look at the scripture. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. So the first thing, before we can say that the day of the Lord is at hand, there must come first a falling away by which we will recognize the identity of the man of sin, one of the final world leaders. Now, it, it further describes the man of sin. It says, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, seated in the temple of God, showing himself that he's God. What this scripture here is saying is that this person is a man of God, in quotes, okay? So, but he's a man of God that has usurped the authority of God. Now, it says, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what we told it, and that is that he might be revealed in his time. So, as at the time the scripture was written, about 2,000 years ago, um, there was, he, was, he was telling them that what is causing the delay of this person is that the time has not come yet. Now, he says, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, 
that is the system that will bring forth this man is already in place. It says, only he who now let it will let until he be taken out of the way. Okay, he who now let it is talking about the presence of the church on the earth, restraining the commencement of the final week of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. Now it says, and then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So now the second entity, the second person, known as that wicked or the wicked one, it says it's going to be revealed also. Now, this is the foundational scripture, and um, we shall proceed for, uh, at this point. So, let us look at the context of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. So, it, it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. Now, the context is the coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto him. The rapture, this is talking about the rapture. The coming of the Lord and our gathering together unto him. He says that he be not so shaken in mind, nor be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So the context is this. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1 to 2 sets the context for verses 3 to 8 that follow. Um, we are given the conditions that will indicate the imminence of the coming of the Lord to rapture the church. Now this rapture we're talking about is uh, described vividly in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 16 to 17. It says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So this is a scripture that describes this rapture event that is spoken of in verse 1 of 2 Thessalonians. By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So the context for all the things that have been that were said in verses 3 to 8 is set in verses 1 to 2. The context is the rapture. The rapture cannot happen until these two people are revealed. The rapture cannot be said to be imminent until these two final world leaders are revealed. The Bible says, let no one deceive you that the time is at hand. For that time shall not come except these two people are revealed. Now, past historical figures thought by many to be um, the Antichrist of end time prophecy at, at their various times include Emperor Nero of Rome, um, Adolf Hitler of Germany, Stalin of Russia, Mao of China, and many others. The reason for people thinking that these people could have been in the, in, at the time the Antichrist of prophecy is because of their anti-Christian disposition and persecution of Christians or and or Jews. But Daniel chapter 9 verses 26 to 27 tells us that the reverse shall be the case for the final Antichrist. Their final Antichrist shall not appear immediately um, as an enemy of Christians or of Jews. He shall appear to be a friend of the Jews and possibly of the Christians at first and shall turn against them at the appointed time. This is what we get from Daniel chapter 9 verses 26 to 27. Okay, he says, for it, he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall break the covenant. The covenant that will be for the uh, benefit of Israel, this final Antichrist will set it in motion, and then he will be the one that will break this covenant, and at that time he will become the enemy of Israel. There are two antichrists. 
though only one of them is the seed of the serpent. So let us look at, uh, it is written in the book of Daniel that at the time of the end, there shall be two major kingdoms and two major antichrists. So um, Daniel chapter 2 verse 41 says, And whereas thou sawest the feet of and toes, part of porous clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. So this image you see here is the image that was seen by King Nebuchadnezzar in a dream of the night. And this dream was interpreted by Daniel to the king. And we see that this image has a head of gold, breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay. So we see the same here, that this head of gold is Babylon. The breast and arms of silver rep represents the Medo Persian kingdom at the time. Now all these kingdoms were superpowers of their times. They were the superpowers on the earth in their times. After the Medo Persian kingdom came Greece. And after Greece came Rome. Rome. And after Rome, we are today in the final era where you have the feet of iron and clay, where there are two kingdoms. Two kingdoms. And we'll talk about that in detail uh, in the next few minutes. Now, the final kingdom shall be divided as two kingdoms in one. There shall be two kings, one king for each kingdom, the Iron Kingdom and the Clay Kingdom. And remember, the Iron Kingdom was also, was also the kingdom that was in existence at the time of Jesus Christ on this earth. That is the Roman Kingdom. And we see at the feet, there is the Roman Kingdom again. So, we will go into details to talk about what this Roman Kingdom is. Okay, so, Daniel chapter 2 verse 44 says, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So here we see, and in the days of these kings, telling us that there are, there are going to be two kings in the final, in the last days. These two kings, one is going to be the king of the Iron Kingdom, and the second one is going to be the king of the Clay Kingdom. This Iron Kingdom is religious in nature, and the Clay Kingdom is secular in nature. It is written in the book of Revelations that there will be two beasts, and that they will walk together. Okay? The beasts with seven heads and ten horns. Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, says, And I looked and I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So this is the beast that is going to be in control of the kingdom of clay. The beast is going to be in control of the kingdom of clay. Now, let us look at the second beast. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 to 12 says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of, out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, so, and he spake as a dragon. Now, this second beast is a beast that is trying to disguise himself as a lamb. We know that Jesus Christ is described as the lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. So this beast is trying to disguise himself as a lamb and trying to cast himself in, a, uh, in the light of a, a religious you know, person. And the Bible says, and he spake as a dragon. In other words, it is the spirit of the, of the, of the dragon that is within, him, within, within the beast, okay? And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. 
What this means is that he is also a superpower leader. He's also a superpower leader. Even though religious, a religious superpower, okay, but a superpower all the same. So he exercised all the power of the first days before him. And, uh, uh, and he caused the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast. So it is this second beast that makes it possible for the first beast to become ruler of the whole world. This second beast, let me make it clear, this religious second beast is the one that makes it possible for the first beast to be ruler over all the nations and tongues and tribes, even as written in the book of Revelation chapter 13. Okay? So, um, and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. It is written also in the book of Revelation that of these two beasts, the first will be known as the beast, while the second will be known as the false prophet. So the first one continues to retain that name, the beast. But even though the second one is also described as a beast with the horns of a lamb, he is also he has a, he also has another name that is the false prophet. There is a reason why the word prophet here is added to his name because he's a religious figure. Okay, now Revelation sixteen thirteen says, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So, the devil is the one that is in control of these two most powerful personalities on the earth. The spirit that is operating in them is the spirit of the dragon. We see that in scripture here. I am not the one saying it. Look at the scripture. The Bible says that it is the spirit of the dragon that is operating in the two. Now, for the greater part of their time, they walked together as two kings of two world powers, secular and religious, to subdue the world. Now, Revelation chapter 13, 12 says, And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and caused the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose dead wound was healed. Okay. Uh, it is written in the book of 2 Thessalonians that believers should not be triggered into emergency mode unless there comes first a falling away through which the man of sin is revealed. So the Lord gives us the, 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 the means whereby we will know for sure the identity of this person. He gives us the major sign. And when we see this major sign, it is our responsibility to begin to look closer to confirm with other signs that have also been specified in prophecy. <clears throat> the second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3 to 4 says, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, seated in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So, this person is going to be revealed by the falling away, according to Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4. The next is that the wicked one, the second person, the second final ruler, is going to be revealed also. It says in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, it says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall conceal with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So we see the first one is revealed here, and the second one is revealed there. And let us remember that the reason we are being told this is that we have been told 
that no one should tell us that the coming of the Lord is imminent unless these two people are revealed. That's the purpose of this scripture. No one should tell you that it is imminent. And when the Bible says imminent, it means that it can happen anytime. Okay? So, let us now go and watch the throne of the kingdom of iron, that is Rome, for the man of sin, or also known as the false prophet. Okay? Investigating the living books of Rome, that is the Vatican. Now, the iron in the feet of the iron and clay is Rome, world religious superpower nation at the time of the end. This iron is Rome, and um, also right now it is the Vatican of Rome. So, Mystery of Babylon the Great, the Great is the religious system of the Vatican that has persecuted true Christians over the centuries and is said to do so again during the tribulation according to prophecy. Revelation chapter 17, 5 to 6 says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Revelation 18 24 says, And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints. So, Rome is surrounded by seven hills. Revelation chapter 17, verse 9 says, And here is the nine which had wisdom, the seven heads of, of the beast. Okay, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman seated. The seven heads referred to are, watch the pointer, this is a, an artist's impression of this uh, woman and the beast. So, it says the seven heads are symbolic of the seven mountains on which the woman seated. And if you go to this side, watch the pointer, this is a map. There are seven hills in Rome and they are labeled here, one to seven. Okay, the seven hills of Rome. So, Rome has influence over the great majority of the nations of the earth. Revelation chapter 17 verse 18 says, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. That great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Rome's Rome's peculiar merchandise is the souls of men. Scripture uses the word soul mostly with reference to the eternal self. Okay? Whenever um, the Bible uses the word soul, it often refers to the eternal self. Talking about the perishing of souls. It's talking about the eternal self that can not be destroyed, even if the physical is destroyed. So, it says, Scripture uses the word soul mostly with reference to the eternal self. Rome offers a larger than life copy of Christianity. And men, hopeful for eternal life, subscribe to this merchandise of hers. Her power comes from the souls of men all over the world who subscribe to what she is offering, okay? So, Rome offers a larger than life copy, remember, see the word here, copy of Christianity. It is not the true Christianity. Now, let us see Revelation chapter 18, verse 9 to 13. And it says, And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. So this is talking about when the mystery Babylon will be destroyed. Standing afar off for fear of 
had turned, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in what hour is thy judgment come? And the merchants of the earth shall we and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. I want you to take notes of something. It says, In what hour is thy judgment come? In what hour is thy judgment come? Now, there is no nation that can be overrun in one hour and destroyed in such a way that the nation will be a heap of ruins if it is not through the use of a nuclear strike. Now, I believe for the description you see here is talking about a nuclear strike. So, the, this word, though written 2,000 years ago, was talking about something that God knows will be um, happening today. Technology that God knows will be available today. So, it says, And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. The merchants of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all pine wood and all manner of vessels of ivory and all manner of vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men, also included as her merchandise, souls of men. And so, history, history and current reality attest to the fact that Mystery Babylon is the religious system of Rome, of the Vatican. To pinpoint the man of sin, we must go to the specific scripture that talks about him in the New Testament. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, except that they, uh, by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. The son of perdition who opposed and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped. So that he as God, seated in the temple of God, showed himself that he is God. So the first major sign for identifying the man of sin is the falling away. Mentioned in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3. The word falling away is from the Greek word apostasia, and it means to depart from the truth. Now, to depart from the truth means that whoever it is that is departing from the truth would have been previously in the truth before choosing to depart. Okay? Now, in 2014, that is the commencement year of the spectacular Jewish blood moon tetrad the most spectacular Jewish blood moon tetrad ever. Seven leaders of the evangelical fold, among whom Kenneth Copeland played a critical role, went to the Vatican to visit Pope Francis. Now, everything that I'm going to say here are things that you can find online. They are researchable. You can go and find them out for yourself. So, I am not saying anything that is not something you can confirm online. So these are pictures that you can get online. So there are discussions, when they went over to the Vatican, there are discussions major on how to make the Church of Jesus Christ one. On how the evangelicals could be made to, be, to see themselves as one with the Roman Catholic Church under the Pope under the Pope. They talked about the church being one, about mixing sheep, that is, believers by the Holy Spirit, and the goats, believers by the doctrines of mystery Babylon's counterfeit Christianity. Mixing the two of them in one fold, they had an agreement to be one. I believe that this is the falling away 
that was referred to in scripture. And it is very clear that this is not only a falling away, but I believe because of the, the numerous signs surrounding this event, I believe that this is the falling away referred to in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. So, let us see how the Bible says that he has God seated in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Let us, now that you have seen the falling away, let us look deeper. Let us look deeper and see if we can find other signs that would confirm that whether this Pope Francis is the one that the Bible is talking about. Now, we opposing the word of God, opposing God by exalting his, his word over the word of God. Opposing God by exalting his word over the word of God. So let us see the things that he has said that contradict and oppose the word of God. Because that is one of the things that the Bible says that he will do. That he will sit in the temple of God, that is, in a position as a man of God and show himself that he's God. In other words, from that position, he will counter the word of God and expect his own word to be received and accepted. Additional means of identifying the man of sin are the fulfillment of other prophetic milestones contained in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4. So, he sits in the temple of God presides over a religious order. He justifies sin. He justifies sin. There is a reason why he is called the man of sin. The reason is because he justifies sin. He makes excuses for sin. He justifies it. So, having been, having been given these characteristics of the man of sin, what is expected of believers is that they should watch the utterances and the writings of whomever sits on the throne of Ion, especially at the period of fulfillment of all signs, to see if they match these prophetically outlined characteristic qualities. Now, Talking about, uh, let us look at King Nebuchadnezzar. We see the image where he commanded that an image should be erected and that everyone should bow to that image at the sound of a trumpet. Now, he made, he gave a decree in writing and orally that all peoples and religions were to worship no other god but the image set up by him. He was redefining God and compelling the world to accept his definition of what God should be. In doing so, he was, in other words, saying that he was God. Because if he can create God, if he can create God, he is saying that he is God. So, this is just um, a little reference to somebody who has tried to do something. And the king of Babylon, the Nebuchadnezzar that did this, is, is in the lineage. Like I said, right from Nimrod, that is the originator and the founder of the Babylonian system, and the rest of them, as stated in the book of Daniel, the head of gold, the breast and arms of silver, belly and thighs of brass, leg of iron, feet of iron and clay. Being Babylon, uh, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, and in the end, Rome again, you know, these are. So these, these are um, the kingdoms, all the various kingdoms of the time of the end. And their leaders, you can see that they have similar characteristic qualities. You can see that they have similar char uh, characteristic qualities. Because this is Nebuchadnezzar sitting in the same position 
as every other leader that has been a leader of a world power in their time. Okay, so Nebuchadnezzar was leader of Babylon. The leader of uh, Medo Persia also was there. The leader of the kingdom of Greece. The leader of Rome also came. And the leader of the final two kingdoms that, that, uh, that are in existence now, the feet of iron and clay, these are the two that we are talking about right now. Now, in 2000 and 16, April 2016, Pope Francis released a document, a book titled Amoris Laetitia. Now this book is the concrete evidence of Pope Francis showing himself as God, courtesy of his declarations in it, that a man of God can have the authority to discern, okay, discern scriptural matters with human wisdom and with his Adamic and fallen conscience and in the interests of the sinful nature of humanity. Now, we as believers can decide scriptures, but it must be by the leading of the Holy Spirit. It must be by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And we can tell when the Holy Spirit is leading us, he will not lead us to discern scripture in the interest of the sinful nature of man. The Holy Spirit will not lead you to discern scripture in the interest of the sinful nature of man. Now, among the highlights of the book is the admonition to priests to be more welcoming and merciful and considerate to the wrongfully divorced and remarried that is the adulterers, the wrongfully divorced and remarried, okay, that is the adulterers. Next, the unmarried but cohabiting, that is the fornicators, okay, and the uh, homosexuals, that is the abusers of themselves with mankind. So, the, the highlights of the book talk about priests being more welcoming and merciful and considerate to these three categories of people. So this is the reason for the title, The Man of Sin. Courtesy of his pronouncements in his book, Amoris Laetitia, this book can actually be, you can download it from the internet. So everything we're going to say today are things you can find out and verify for yourself. So, um, let us now, uh, so what it means to oppose God and exalt oneself above God and show oneself as God. Yeah. So, let us now do a review of three critical points in this publication of Pope Francis. So, this AL, this is AL 37 that is Amoris the uh, chapter 10, paragraph 37. Okay, so, exalting himself over the word of God by exalting the carnal descendants of scripture over scripture, spiritual descendants. Now, this, you know, you can, like I said, go to the internet, download this book, and go to this yourself, and see it for yourself. Okay, so let us proceed. We have not thought that by, simply by stressing doct doctrinal, bioethical, and moral issues without encouraging openness to grace, we were providing sufficient support to families, strengthening the marriage bond and giving meaning to marital life. This is the words of Pope Francis. We find it difficult to present marriage more as a dynamic path to personal development and fulfillment than as a lifelong burden. So he said, we find it difficult to present marriage more as a dynamic path to personal development and fulfillment than as a lifelong burden. We also find it hard to make room for the consciences of the faithful 
who very often respond as best they can to the gospel and meet their limitations and are capable of carrying out their own discernment in complex situations. We have been called to form consciences, not to replace them. Now, in other words, what Pope Francis is saying, I, ha I have to interpret this is what he said, and below is my own analysis of what he's saying. Okay? This is my analysis of what he's saying, and I want you to do your own analysis and know whether, what it is saying also for you. Now, in other words, Pope Francis is saying that the word of God is too grievous for the faithful who do what they have to anyway and that the church should step in by reforming consciences that is, watering down the word of God to enable the conscience accommodate sin without guilt and making it resistant to the truth these are things that should be done in order to help the faithful so you do your own analysis and see whether this is not the interpretation you will get from this let's move to the next one AL305 and it says here for this reason, a pastor cannot feel that it is enough to simply apply moral laws to those living in irregular situations as if they were stones to throw at people's lives. So, now, when you say the word of God, the way it is, he's he, he saying that it's like you're throwing stones at people. Okay? So, along this, this same lines, the International Theological Commission has noted that natural law could not be presented as an already established set of rules that impose themselves a priori on the moral subject. Rather, it is a source of objective inspiration for the deeply personal process of making decisions. Because of forms of conditioning and mitigating factors, it is possible that in an objective situation of sin, which may not be subjectively culpable or fully such, a person can be living in God's grace, can love, and can also grow in the life of grace and charity while receiving the church's, the church's help to this end. Okay, so let us, let us dissect this paragraph a little bit. Okay. So, in other words, Pope Francis is saying that pastors must henceforth cease to lift up the banner of God's moral laws in a manner that unfairly convicts the erring of sin. Because these laws are merely guidelines. So, the word of God are, is merely a guideline. Just try, if you are if able, okay, if you are not, okay. Okay, so he says, and how we follow them, how we, how we flow with them is our personal business. Because he it says it's an individual, individual thing. It is possible that one may be in an apparently sinful situation and not be personally liable because it is not his fault, it is the fault of the flesh. Okay? yet still be living in God's grace and be capable of growth in God's grace and Christian love. And the church must affirm such persons in love because of their handicap, the flesh. It is an abomination to discern what, so let's see what the word of God says about all of this. We have seen three instances now. Let us see what the Word of God has to say about this. It is an abomination to discern the Word of God for evil and iniquity. Romans 1.23 says, And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. Change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. So, you can see that the Word of God is, has said it, that the time will come when people are going to try to, you know, 
water down the glory of incorruptible God and make it more um, amenable to mankind. Okay? So, Romans 1.25 says, Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever? Forever. Amen. Who changed the truth of God into a lie? Saying that the truth of God's word does not matter anymore. And seeking to please men and human beings and faithfuls of the church instead of pleasing God. Okay? Choosing to please men, uh, men instead of pleasing God. It says, first of all, they change the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature that's the created above the creator. Now, Romans 1 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all of godliness and unrighteousness of men. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness? Men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Okay, so let us continue. You cannot take God's grace as a license to promote iniquity. You can't do that. Romans 6, 1-4 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? If it is not possible for human beings to live above the sins of the flesh and God is telling us that we should live above the sins of the flesh then it's like saying that God is telling a lie so it says know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So in Christ, we have a new life. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In Christ, we have a new life. The Bible says that to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God. So, we have the Holy Spirit in us, and that is the power by which we will walk as children of God on this earth. We also have the Word of God. When you uh, uh, read the Word of God and obey it, then you will be able to live your life even as our Lord lived. So, um, verse 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 19 says, Nevertheless the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Everyone that names the name of Christ, the Bible says, depart from iniquity. There is no excuse for iniquity. Iniquity leads to the Spirit of God leaving your heart. And when the Spirit of God leaves your heart, that means you are no more a Christian. Technically, you are no more a Christian. The Bible says, if any man have not the Spirit of God, he is none of his. God does not lower his standards in any situation or for anyone. God does not lower his standard in any situation or for anyone. James 1 verse 17 says, Every good and perfect and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Matthew 5 48 says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Hebrews 13 verse 8, Jesus the same yesterday and today 
and forever. God does not change. His standards does not and will never change. Now, attacking the institution of marriage, okay, through um, the, the making excuses for cohabitation, divorce, and remarriage. Now, let us see. Um, A.L., that is Amoris Laetitia, paragraph 53. Some society, it says, some societies still maintain the practice of polygamy. In other places, arranged marriages are an enduring practice. Dot, dot, dot. In many places, not only in the West, the practice of living together before marriage is widespread. Now, this is Pope Francis speaking, remember? Okay? So, as well as a type of cohabitation which totally excludes any intention to marry. In various countries, legislation facilitates a growing variety of alternatives to marriage, with the result that marriage, with its characteristics of exclusivity, indissolubility, and openness to life, comes to appear as an old-fashioned and outdated option. Many countries are witnessing the legal deconstruction of the family, tending to adopt models based almost exclusively on the autonomy of the individual will. Surely, it is legitimate and right to reject all the forms of the traditional family marked by authoritarianism, dot, 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 and even violence. Yet this should not lead to a disparagement of marriage itself, but rather to the rediscovery of its authentic meaning and its renewal. The strength of the family lies in its capacity to love and to teach how to love. For all a family's problems, it can always grow beginning with love. Okay, now this, let us see, look at this and see if we can look deeper to see what he is really saying here. So in other words, Pope Francis is saying that many societies and cultures today practice different forms of living together aside from the traditional concept of marriage. And that this is a fact the church must come to terms with and accommodate. And that what is crucial in all forms of family or marriages should be love and learning to love. Okay? So, this is in, in a way um, saying that the church must come to terms with what is happening around and learn to accommodate. AL122. We should not, however, confuse different levels. There is no need to lay upon two limited persons the tremendous burden of having to reproduce perfectly the union existing between Christ and his church. For marriage as a sign entails a dynamic process, one which advances gradually with the progressive integration of the gifts of God. In other words, what Pope Francis is saying here is that the demands of the Word of God regarding marital union in Christendom are unrealistic and possibly mean, and that they can only be possibly met by Jesus Christ himself. Okay? He says that uh, there is no need to lay upon two limited persons the tremendous burden of having to reproduce perfectly the union existing between Christ and the church. He is saying that the word of God, okay, the demands of the word of God regarding marriage in Christendom are unrealistic and mean, and that they can only possibly be met by Jesus Christ himself. So, do the analysis yourself and see what you get from that. Now, AL243, let us see what it says. It says, it is important that the divorced who have entered a new union should be made to feel part of the church. They are not excommunicated and they should not be treated as such, since they remain part of the ecclesial community. These situations 
require careful discernment and respectful accompaniment. Language or conduct that might lead them to feel discriminated against should be avoided. And they should be encouraged to participate in the life of the community. So, in other words, Pope Francis is saying that regardless of what the Word of God says, even under the condition of adultery, the wrongfully divorced and remarried must be accepted in the church and treated as saints. Now, I'm not saying that there is no divorce that is, um, uh, will I say, sometimes some people have divorce, divorce foisted upon them. That is a different thing. That's why I say wrongfully divorced. Wrongfully divorced. The word of God and our Lord Jesus Christ does not permit anyone who says that he is a child of God and is obedient to Christ to divorce. In other words, anyone who is supposed to be a Christian and you are, you are married and you decide to take yourself away from your partner in divorce, what you are saying is that you no longer are obedient to the word of God. In other words, you have removed yourself from the body of Christ. So, so the wrongfully divorced and remarried, he's saying that they should be accepted and treated as saints. That is in violation of the word of God. What does the God say, the word of God say on, the, on this matter? God expects his children to obey him in all things. Matthew 5 48 says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect. 1 Corinthians 7 10 to 11 says, And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 to 11. Unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. This is the standard of God concerning Christian marriage. Anything outside of this, you are saying that you are not part of it. So, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but homongers and adulterers God will judge. Matthew 19 verse 6 says, Wherefore there are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. God's standards are unnegotiable. God's standards are unnegotiable. Repent and do the right thing or face God's judgment. This is what it is. First Corinthians chapter 5 verse 11 and 13 says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator. With such a one, no, not to eat. Don't even eat with such a person. He says, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Now, this is talking about the body of Christ. He's not talking about people in the world. No. He's talking about the body. Someone saying that he is a brother and he's a fornicator. Just like someone saying that he is a homosexual Christian. There is nothing like there is nothing like that, and there is nothing like a a fornicator brother or an adulterer brother. Once you have labeled yourself as that, you have ex excluded yourself from the body of Christ. Now, attacking the institution of marriage, let us look at homosexuality and see what the Pope has to say about this. 
AL52, Amoris Laetitia 52. And the Pope says in this paragraph, we need to acknowledge the great variety of family situations that can offer certain stability, but the factor of same-sex unions, for example, may not simply be equated with marriage. No union that is temporary or close to the transmission of life can ensure the future of society. But nowadays, nowadays, who is making an effort to strengthen marriages, to help married couples overcome their problems, to assist them in the work of raising children, and to encourage the stability of the marriage bond? Hmm. This is heavy. Now, in other words, Pope Francis is saying that those same-sex unions neither hold procreative worth they nevertheless have their peculiar value in the society. And that as male, female marriages are weakening, these same-sex unions are showing commendable example of what marriage between two individuals should be. And that they are also even helping to raise children. Read AL52 and see whether my interpretation is wrong of this. Read it yourself and come to your own conclusions. AL 250, let us see what he says there. The church makes her own attitude, makes her own the attitude of the Lord Jesus who offers his boundless love to each person without exception. We would like before all else to reaffirm that every person, regardless of sexual orientation, ought to be respected in his or her dignity and treated with consideration, while every sign of unjust discrimination is to be carefully avoided, particularly any form of aggression and violence. Such families should be given respectful pastoral, pastoral guidance so that those who manifest a homosexual orientation can receive the assistance they need to understand and fully carry out God's will in their lives. This is not talking about, this, this is just talking about how the, the homosexuals will continue to live in the body of Christ and do, you know, working in the body of Christ as homosexuals. Complete abomination. Now, let's see what I said about this. In other words, Pope Francis is saying that Jesus loves unrepentant homosexual persons. <laughs> that Jesus loves unrepentant homosexual persons. And as such, they should not be discriminated against. And that they should, within their homosexuality, be given the necessary support and encouragement that they need to retain their, self, their sense of self-esteem and to be useful in the church as homosexuals. Read it and come to your own conclusion. This is my own analysis. What does the Word of God say about this matter? Our repentant homosexuals and fornicators and transgenders are doomed to eternal damnation. This is the word of God. Proverbs 28 verse 13 says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. You must confess and forsake the sin and receive God's grace to live your life as a child of God. Aside from them, the Bible says, he that covers his sins shall not prosper. That means yes, we can't move forward. We cannot be part of the kingdom of God. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 to 10 says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners 
shall inherit the kingdom of God. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 and 13 says, I wrote to you in an epistle not to company with fornicators or homosexuals, brackets mine. Therefore, put away from among yourself that wicked person. So, if someone has come and identified himself as a fornicator or a homosexual, the word of the Lord is clear on the matter. What you do about that person? He says, put it away from amongst you. That's what the word of God says. Because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Romans chapter 1 verse 26 says, For this cause God gave them up to vile, unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Jude 1 7 says, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, that is homosexuality, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So Sodom and Gomorrah were not just destroyed by physical fire. Everyone that was destroyed in that city was doomed to hell. Now, we want to also look at some other utterances of Pope Francis. Let us analyze what other things that he has said. Now, in 2013, he made a comment in an interview. He says, if a person is gay and seeks the Lord and has good will, who am I to judge them? These things are things you can find on the internet. Just Google it. Okay, so in other words, he is saying that since God created some persons gay, as they claim, why then should he judge the, why then should he judge their actions? Blame God. Blame God that created them gay. Okay? Now, he also said, proselytism is solemn nonsense. That is evangelism or sharing the gospel. He says, is solemn nonsense. It makes no sense. We need to get to know each other, listen to each other, and improve our knowledge of the world around us. In other words, what he's saying is that the evangelism of the gospel is out of fashion. Unity of all religions is the way forward. Okay. In 2014, in a homily, he said, when love fails, and it fails many times, we have to feel the pain of that failure, accompany the people who have felt the failure of their love. So, in other words, he said in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 8, which says, love never fails, is a lie. And that God, who himself is love, is a failure. Well, look at it and come to your own conclusion. In 2015, Okay, so this uh, was published, this statement here was published in the fourth article on interview granted by Pope Francis to an atheist, Eugenio Scalfari of La Repubblica. So, he says here, There is no punishment but the annihilation of that soul. With the death of the body, their journey is finished. Okay, so the Vatican has not come out to accept this statement as authentic. But Eugenio Scalfari of La Repubblica published this as what the Pope said. So in other words, the Pope is saying that hell, as described in scripture, is not real. Remember, we are watching the throne uh, of the kingdom of iron for the man of sin. And what we are looking at are the characteristics, things that will cause us to consider and know whether this is the man that the Bible is talking about, that his appearance would mark the imminence of the rapture of the church. In 2016, in a prayer, he said, that each may contribute to the common good and to the building of a society that places the human person at the center. 
In other words, he is saying that everything, including religion, must act in the interest of man's will, not God's will. In 2017, in a general audience at St. Peter Square, he said, At the end of our history, there is the merciful Jesus. Everything will be saved. Everything. Everything will be saved. Everything. In other words, he is saying that the word of God is a lie, and in the end, that everybody will go to heaven. That everybody will go to heaven. So, but Bible says that this man of sin sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And we see the words that are coming out of him. Okay, so in 2018, on the subject of the eternal fate of man, in an interview granted to the same Eugenius Calvary, he said, They are not punished. Those who repent obtain God's forgiveness and take their place among the ranks of those who contemplate him. But those who do not repent and cannot be forgiven disappear. A hell does not exist. This disappearance of souls exists. In other words, he is saying that the word of God is a lie and that sinners will not go to hell. Is Pope Francis the man of sin? This is the question. Okay? In 2013, he won both the Time Magazine and Game Magazine, uh, the Advocate Person of the Year Award. The scriptures enlighten us that it is strange for the world to celebrate anyone who is truly preaching the Word of God as it should be preached. Luke chapter 6, verse 26 says, Woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. In 2014 to 2015, the years of the blood moons and the midnight sign for the church. I believe that was the midnight sign for the church. A falling away from the faith to the mystery religion was observed. This, of course, was the result of subterranean proselytism which commenced possibly as soon as he took office. For one that refers to proselytism as solemn nonsense, he employed it fully in his interest and thus fulfilled scripture. Is Pope Francis the man of sin? I leave you with the reply of Jesus Christ to the disciples of John the Baptist when they came to ask him if he was the one. Luke chapter 7, verse 19 to 23. And John calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are thou he that should come? Or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John the Baptist had sent us unto thee, saying, Are thou he that should come? Or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Then Jesus answered and said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things he have seen and heard. How that the blind see, the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended, in me. So, what is this scripture saying? We have seen the signs. We have seen so many things about this man that is sitting on the throne of the kingdom of Ion, of the Vatican. So, could Pope Francis be the man of sin? As we analyze the clues given to us by our Lord, each person was indeed Answer this question for himself. You have to answer this question for yourself. I am personally sure of one thing though, and that is, there is fire on the mountain, and I, I must run, run, run. I must walk to be prepared. I must ensure that I am preparing as a wise virgin 
for the coming of the Lord. And now we move to part two of this teaching. Watching the throne of the clay kingdom. Now, the clay kingdom, like I said, all the kingdoms of Babylon, uh, starting from Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, Rome, okay, all of them have been superpowers of their times. Okay, so watching the throne of the clay kingdom, which is also a superpower, and right now that position is the position that the United States state is um, occupying. So watching the throne of the clay kingdom for the wicked one or the lawless one, aka the beast. Now, I will deliberately not allow you to come to your conclusions about whom this person might be. I will not be mentioning names in this teaching, but I mentioned names in the book. My book, you can go to www.noahsarkhf.org and download a free copy of my book. So I, I mentioned names in my book, but I will not be mentioning names here because I want you to come to think and arrive at your own conclusion. Now, we are told in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, that the Antichrist, known as the wicked one, or man of lawlessness, will show up after the man of sin takes his seat of authority. So what appears first, after that, the next one appears. But the one that appears first is the man of sin. After that, the wicked one appears. Now, it's, we remember the scripture that says um, that uh, let no man deceive you by any means, for that they shall not come except they are coming before in the way first, and that man of sin be revealed. So the man of sin will be revealed first. Next, next the wicked one is revealed. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.8 says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So let's interpret the first two words of 2 Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.8 within context. I discovered that sometimes to get the real meanings of some words in scripture, you, the Holy Ghost will lead you to go to the original scripture and to look at the spectrum of words that can be used in the place of that word. Now, we see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 8 where it says, and then, now look at these first two words here, um, highlighting it with the pointer, and then shall that we get, and then, okay, so, that word and was translated by King James from the Greek word K-A-I, Kai. And you could replace it with the English word also. The word then was translated by the King James Version from the Greek word Tote, T-O-T-E. And you can replace that with at that time. Okay, this is another word that can be used. Another word in the spectrum of words that can be used for this word. So, when you plug that in, when you plug this in, what you get is also at the time shall the, that we get be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Also at the time, because the context is, with, is talking about the things that must be in place before we can say that the rapture is imminent. That is the context of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1 down to 8. So, we see that these two people have been, you know, um, uh, uh, stated that they, they would appear before the rapture can be said to be imminent. So, um, sometimes some people have interpreted 
this verse 8 in a, in a different way. Some have interpreted it to be a reference to the same person spoken of earlier. And also to mean that the revelation of the man of sin would come after the rapture. Okay? Because verse 8 comes after verse 7. Verse 7 says, Only he that let it shall let until he be taken out of the way. That is a reference to the rapture. Then verse 8 says, And then shall that wicked be revealed. So it gives it can give the sense that this scripture is saying that it is after the rapture that they will be revealed, but that is not so. Now the scripture is saying that also at that time shall that this wicked be revealed. The second person will be revealed at that time. Because the entire context of the verses that we read is we are being told the things that will cause us to know that the, that the rapture is imminent, that the day of the Lord is at hand. So, we see uh, in the book of Daniel that there are two kingdoms in one, so hence two kings, okay? Two kings. Okay, so, uh, so if you contemplate 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1 to 8 within context, you will realize that it is talking about the conditions that must be fulfilled before we can say that the day of the Lord or the appearing of our Lord to take his pride, that is the rapture, is imminent. The final two world leaders must be revealed before the rapture takes place. And the question that we have now is, have they been revealed? And I believe that they have been revealed. So, I said earlier that um, past historical figures taught by many to be the Antichrist of end time prophecy and, and the, in, in those times include em, Emperor Nero of Rome and of Hitler of Germany, Joseph Stalin of Russia, Chano Mao of China and others. The reason is their anti-Christian disposition and persecution of Christians and Jews. On the contrary, as, like I said before, the final Antichrist comes first as a friend of the Jews before showing himself as their enemy. And you will get this from Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 to 27, because he confirms a covenant that is in favor of Israel, and then in the middle of that covenant, of this final seven years, he breaks that covenant. Now, let us check, you know, and find out, did the Bible give us any idea the prophetic point of emergence of the wicked one, that is, the beast or the seed of the serpent, okay? Are we given any clue as to where he will be emerging from? Let us look at um, uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 21 to 22. He says, and in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give the honor of the kingdom. But he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. And with the arms of the flood, they shall be overflown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. So this person is known as the prince of the covenant. This final world leader is also is known as the prince of the covenant. So, Daniel 11, 40 to 44 says, At the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, push at him, that is, at the prince of the covenant, and the king of the north shall come against him like a well wind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. 
But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Egyptians and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Oh, sorry. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Then it says, But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. So, out of the northeast, tidings shall trouble him. And he says, Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly make to make away many. So, we see that this king from this scripture is attacked by the king of the north. He is also attacked by the king of the south. Then he attacks the the um, uh, he attacks the northeast. The only place that is left that is not mentioned here is the west. Okay, so we see that it is the west that is not mentioned. So. <clears throat> Now let us uh, uh, check uh, prophetic evidence of the fact of super power kingdoms as locations for the seat of Satan. We are going to look at prophetic evidence of the fact of super power kingdoms as the seat of Satan. Now we look at uh, Revelation chapter 13 verse 1 to 2. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. The dragon gave him his power. The dragon gave him, the dragon is Satan, gave him his power and also gave him his seat. So Satan gave him his seat and great authority. Okay? So, um, so what we are saying here, try to um, establish that superpower kingdoms and nations over the millennia have been the seat of Satan. Now Daniel started off his palace service from the kingdom of Babylon, that is the head of gold, that is superpower nation uh, of the time. Babylon is a world system or kingdom allied with Satan in opposition to the word of God. Nimrod was the first anti-God or anti-Christ. Nimrod's kingdom of Babel in China was therefore the original location of the seed of Satan. After Babylon, under Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar came medo Persia, the breast and arms of silver, and it was seed of Satan. Daniel chapter 10 verse 13 says, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. So we see that after Daniel came the Medo Persian, I'm oh, sorry, after Babylon came the Medo Persian kingdom. And now it is said to be the the prince of the kingdom of Persia, okay, is the one in control also at this time. Now, after Persia, the next opposition to things of God will come from the prince of Greece. As the seat of Satan moves to Greece, that is the belly and thighs of brass. The nature of battles waged by divine forces on behalf of the people of God over the generations was revealed to Daniel in the scripture below. Daniel chapter 10 verse 20 it says Then said he Knowest thou wherefore I am come unto thee and now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia and when I am gone forth lo the prince of Grisha shall come So in other words we are seeing something here we are seeing a prophecy to Daniel even while yet the Greece had not yet become a world superpower at the time. The prophecy was given that the next place is going to be that to be seen as Satan will be Greece. It says, the prince of Grisha shall come after the prince of Persia. Now, 
Pergamos is located in Turkey and was known for um, for one once being the capital of Rome, that is the world superpower in the province of Asia Minor at the time. Revelation chapter 2, verse 12 to 13 says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things said he which had the sharp sword with, uh, with two edges, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. So it is interesting to see the movement of the seed of Satan from Babylon to Persia, okay, and from Persia to Greece, all world powers at the time, and now to Rome. Okay, and now to Rome. So, let us continue. Let us um, consider God's sovereign will over the kingdoms and kings of Babylon. Okay, so um, throughout scripture, God has always influenced kings of Babylonian systems to punish his people when they, when they sin and to favor them afterwards when they repent. This is the nature and might of the sovereign will of God. So God is able to use anything that he has created, everything will work to, for, the, for his will. Everything will work to ensure that his will is fulfilled. Examples of kings used in such manner include Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus, Darius, Artaxerxes, who were, all, who were used of God to punish the people of Israel to favor them as well, and to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. We are also told that the final secular king of Babylon will first be a friend of Israel before becoming her worst enemy. Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 to 27. Will, he will seek her peace first, and then seek to destroy her. So, in seeking her peace first, the, the illusion is created that he, this is someone that you can trust, that this is someone to be embraced. Okay? So, Christians are most likely going to embrace or would have embraced such a person. Whenever this takes place, if it already has not, it will potentially be a stumbling block to true believers alive at the time because many shall be deceived. But the grace of God will rest, restore the sincere. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 8 to 9 says, And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the walking of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So we see that this individual is someone that is capable of deceiving, deceiving people, even the people of God. So let us examine characteristics of the seed of Satan. The wicked one shall first become ruler of the kingdom of clay that is the world secular superpower nation, he shall suffer a deadly wound to one of his heads and recover miraculously and proceed to become the ruler of all the nations of the earth. Now, let me take this again. It says, the wicked one shall first become ruler of the kingdom of clay, that is world superpower nation, world secular superpower nation. He shall suffer a deadly wound to one of his heads and recover miraculously and proceed to become the ruler of all the nations of the earth. Revelation 2, 12 to 13 says, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things said he which had the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thy, thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. Pergamos 
is located in Turkey and was known for one, once being the capital city of Rome, that is world superpower in the province of Asia Minor. Two, the altar of Zeus, that is seed of Satan, which was located there before it was granted to Germany by Turkey over a century ago. So the altar of Zeus, or seed of Satan, was there. Three, beautiful temples dedicated to a variety of gods was also um, a popular thing that you would see in Pergamos. Noted for worship of Dionysus, Dionysus, son of Zeus, true eating of raw meat, drinking of excess wine, dancing, and sexual immorality in the streets. The festival of Dionysus was so immoral that it was banned in Rome. Pergamum was the first Roman city to establish an emperor cult. The first city to establish an emperor cult. They worshipped Caesar Augustus at the Athena temple where they declared him both God and King. So, Revelation chapter 13 verses 1 to 2, let us look at that again. And I stood upon the sun of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a deer, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him, he gave him his power and his seat and great authority. This is something, this scripture is said to be fulfilled at the time of the end, in the last days. Okay? That is, and I believe that the, you see again in here, the dragon gave him his seat, the seat of Satan. Okay, so let us see. As we proceed, we will know and discern to know whether this scripture will, has been fulfilled already. Okay? Now, characteristics of the seed of Satan. Number one, world superpower, okay, which Rome was and still is because of the Vatican. The Vatican is world religious superpower nation. Ancient religion, as we saw in, in Pergamos, Okay, three beautiful temple architecture, beautiful temple architecture. Four hedonism and sexual immorality. And five the rise of an emperor cult, worship of Caesar Augustus as king and god. Okay, so now let us compare this to the United States. World superpower. Okay, is the United States the most powerful nation in the world? Answer is yes. Okay, are there any ancient religious symbolisms? Okay, like number two here, ancient religion. Any ancient religious symbolism? Yes, there is. Egyptian and Masonic. Okay, there are Egyptian and Masonic symbols, religious symbols here. For instance, now I'll take you to, this is the Vatican. Watch the pointer. Okay, this is the Vatican. You can see the dome of uh, St. Peter's Basilica here, and here you can see the um, obelisk, okay, the, the, the obelisk here, okay. This obelisk um, is a mystical symbol of, uh, of legend, okay, a mystical symbol of legend. It is the phallus of Nimrod. It is said to be represents the phallus of Nimrod. And this dome is said to represent the womb, the womb of Semiramis. Okay? So this is the phallus facing the dome, that is the womb. What it is speaking to is a prophetic sign speaking to the birth of the new of the beast, the final world leader the birth of the final world leader. 
Now, this is in the Vatican that you're seeing this. Now, come down to, the, to Washington, D.C., the United States. You see here, for, watch the pointer, you see the dome of the Capitol, the Capitol um, uh, building. You see the dome here. Right across, opposite it, is the Washington Monument, the obelisk of the Washington Monument. Okay? Dome facing obelisk. Up here in the Vatican, dome facing obelisk. Is this a coincidence? Do you think this is a coincidence? This tells you of the mystical foundation of Babylon, acknowledged openly even in our time. Okay? So, now, let us proceed. Hedonism and sexual immorality. It was there in Rome at the time. Is it here today? Yes. Legalization of abortion, exports of homosexuality, and LGBT glorification. All those are hedonism and sexual immorality. And we also know the kind of things that happen during um, pride um, uh, rallies and so on. So, number five, the rise of an emperor cult was there in Rome at the time. Is it here today? Yes. This is becoming noticeable within fellowship of certain political leaders in the United States. So let us proceed. So the anointing oil of Babylon rolls down the head of Nimrod's Babylon down to the kingdoms and millennia to the feet of iron and clay. Today, as we speak, the position of Babylon could both be ascribed to the United States, Great Babylon, Revelation 16, 19, and the Vatican, Mystery Babylon the Great, Revelation 17, 5, 9, and 18. Just as Babylon is a prophetic nation in God's scheme of things, Egypt is also a prophetic nation in the life of Israel. Egyptian and Babylonian religious symbolisms of the obelisk and the dome, as well as the pyramid, can be found in the Vatican as well as in the United States. In the United States, instruments of power, money, and architecture. So, prophetically, the U.S. is a secular Babylon because in Babylon of China, all mankind was represented. Genesis 11, 1 and 4. In the U.S. today, all nations of the earth are represented in the United States. The Babylon of, of the last days will be marked by racial issues arising from the agglomeration of peoples from all, all over the earth. Incidentally, the United Nations headquarters that a symbol of one world government also happens to be domiciled in the United States. So, prophetically, the United States is as Egypt because Egypt was a protector and nourisher of Israel just as the U.S. has been and still is now. Secondly, Egypt was persecutor of Israel just as the U.S. will be three and a half years after the rapture according to prophecy. So, who done it? Okay, who, who is this person? In recent times, powerful personalities have been considered for various reasons as possible candidates for the position of Antichrist or the Beast. I shall deliberately, like I said before, I shall not be naming any past or present uh, political leader during this teaching. Um, I don't want to cause any distraction and I want you to be able to think for yourself and come to your own conclusion. So I shall just be mentioning signs and things, prophecies that have been fulfilled and allow you to do your own research and know where it falls. From the scriptures we shall examine, we can deduce that whoever this person could be, if he has been revealed, has to be someone that has previously occupied or 
still could be occupying the seat of the most powerful secular nation in the world. As we search the scriptures for more clues, let's keep this in mind. So let us look at the personalities, the personality and policies of this final world ruler. Remember, the Bible says we will see them before the rapture, but they will not begin to operate in the capacity of the false prophet and the beast until the rapture takes place. That is when they will begin, enter into their official capacities and begin to operate as the false prophet and the beast within the seven year period that will follow. Now, we see Daniel chapter 9 verse 23. It says, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgression transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, shall arise. Now, the wicked one shall apparently have a personal policy of direct communication with his audience. The understanding, okay, is the King James interpretation of the Hebrew word D I Y N, the in, okay, and it means to inform, this being means to inform or to instruct, to inform or to instruct. The word dark sentences, dark sentences, is interpreted from the Hebrew word chida and means sententious maxim. Sententious maxim. Now, a maxim is a concise and powerful statement generally accepted as truth. Concise and powerful statement generally accepted as truth. Sententious refers to the self-righteous, judgmental, pontifical, opinionated, or dictatorial manner of delivering that maxim. Okay? So, this person shall have a direct policy, a, a, a personal policy of communicating directly with his audience. So, let's move to the next um, sign. Misogynist. Daniel chapter 11, verse 37 says, Neither shall he regard dot dot the desire of women. Okay? Now, this is a scripture that has confused many into thinking that the wicked one will be a homosexual. You look at the way it is put. Neither shall he regard the desire of women. Okay? Now, the scripture actually means that the wicked one shall show no deference or special regard for the weaker sex, that is, women. The word desire is from the Hebrew word gender and means precious or pleasant, delicate sensibilities, nature. Okay? So, the scripture appears to be saying that the dealings of this early Christ with the female gender will give the sense that he has no regard for the delicate sensibilities of women in general. Egocentric. Daniel chapter 11 verse 37 says, For he shall magnify himself above all. The wicked one shall be the king of egotism and shall crave praise. He shall crave praise and see himself as the center of the entire world. Okay? He shall crave praise and see himself as the center of the entire world. This is one of his characteristics. Now let's see how he emerges into power. 
let's let's see how he gets into power. He's a politician. So, victory by a handful rather than the vast majority. Daniel 11.23 says, For he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. He shall come up and become strong with a small people. The wicked one shall gain power by virtue of a democratic process involving the electoral power of a small group rather than the popular electoral power of the majority. Could the scripture, this scripture above be a possible reference to the U.S. electoral college system and its possible role in making the final world leader strong or emerge as ruler? So, this is food for thought. Two final confirmation signs of the identity of the wicked one. The movement of the United States Embassy to Jerusalem. Daniel chapter 11 verse 45 says, And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Now, the tabernacles of his palace is another word for embassy. Okay, tabernacles of his palace. Now, between the seas in the glorious holy mountain is the description of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. The U.S. recognition of Jerusalem as capital of Israel, a movement of the embassy to this location, has critical and prophetic implications. The new United States embassy is currently located um, for. 0.4 kilometers and 13 minutes away by car from the Temple Mount, the historic site where Abraham placed his son Isaac on the altar in obedience to God. The city of Jerusalem is itself located between the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea. Okay? It says between, between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Okay, so we see the Jerusalem. Temple Mount is in Jerusalem, is between the seas, between the Mediterranean Sea and the Dead Sea. So could this movement of the embassy to Jerusalem in 2018 be a fulfillment of the Daniel 11.45 scripture? Remember that the person who moves this, who fulfills this scripture, Daniel 11.45, is the one that takes this world system to the end of days and the millennial return of Jesus Christ after the seven year tribulation period. Now, the final sign, the confirmation of the peace covenant. Daniel chapter 11 verse 22 says, And with the arms of the flood shall they be overflown from before him and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Now, the prince of the covenant is a title given to the wicked one or the beast in the scripture above because of his effort, peculiar interest in and success in securing a peace treaty or covenant that has Israel as its major beneficiary. The implementation of this covenant shall provide the protection that Israel shall enjoy for the first three and a half years after the rapture. So this covenant will provide the protection that Israel needs for the first three and a half years after the rapture, because after the rapture, the Satan is going to try to attack Israel immediately. But it will be it will not work because Israel will enjoy protection because of this covenant. Now, the rapture will open the final week, that is seven years of Daniel's prophetic 70 weeks. 
that is uh, 490 years, which shall be concluded with the second coming of Jesus Christ for the millennial reign. So, countries that are currently subscribed to recent peace deal include United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco. Since we are looking at the United States being the most powerful nation on earth, the question that ar arises is, was the Daniel 9.27 scripture fulfilled through this accord? Was the Daniel 9.27 scripture fulfilled through this accord? And if so, what does that mean? And what does it imply? Think about it. Revelation 13, verse 1 to 7. And the metamorphosis of a world leader. Let us see. Revelation 13, 1 to 4 says, And I stood upon the side of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wandered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon which gave power to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? So, how the deadly wound was healed? Let us look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 5 to 7. It says, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now this word translated as continue is from the Greek word, is from the Greek word poio, and what it means is to act. To act. Okay? So power was given to him. It's, you could make the mistake of thinking that he is continuing in the position that he came into initially from Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 and 2. But what this is saying is that power was given to him to act, not to continue in his power position, because, you know, power was given to him to act 40 and 2 months. Okay? Remember, he had suffered a deadly wound. After he came to power, he suffered a deadly wound. And now uh, he recovers from that deadly wound. And as a result, power is given to him to act for 42 months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name his, and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Okay, he, he begins to fight the Christians, okay? And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So this 42 month power that is given to him is over all the nations of the earth. It's not over one nation anymore as in the beginning. In Revelation 13, verse 1 and 2, where he got power to preside over the seed of Satan, the most powerful entity, secular super, uh, power nation of the world. So now he becomes ruler of all the nations of the world. Now this is not he can, this is not possible that that all nations will just hand over power to have one person rule over them. What is going to make this possible is the rapture of the saints. And they are beginning to talk about the, the narrative, what they are going to give, tell the world that happened 
once the rapture occurs. They are talking about the UFOs right now. They are talking about UFOs. The time is coming when the Lord will appear and take his church. And the body of Christ shall be caught up out of this earth in an instant. People are going to disappear all over the world. And they are going to say it's the aliens. They are going to say it's the UFOs. And they are, going to, they are not going to say it's Jesus. Instead, they are going to say everyone must get a mark. A mark. They are going, that is the mark of the beast. And when Christians refuse to take the mark of the beast, the Christians that are left behind, those who were not ready, those who were not watching for the coming of the Lord, those who were not wise, they were not prepared, they will be left behind and they will refuse to take the mark of the beast and the, be the beast will wage war against them and kill many of them. So, let us analyze the scripture. It says, he comes to power as leader of the most powerful nation on earth. The lifeblood of a ruler is power. The lifeblood of any political ruler is power. When the power goes, the life that person dies politically. So, the beast suffers a deadly wound, something that disconnects him from power for a while. Something happens and he turns his attention to heaven and utters blasphemous words against heaven. This event is the rapture, which will also be cast as an assault on the earth by aliens or UFOs. So based on this new world scenario, the beast is made leader of all the nations of the earth, a common leader to tackle a common threat. He is given 42 months to act. But when you read, when you study the book of Revelations and you study the book of Daniel, you see that he does not stop after 42 months. After 42 months, he decides he will continue. And that's going to result in some wars. So, this is a pictorial representation of Revelation chapter 13, verse 1 to 7. The beast takes the seed of, seed of Satan. Then he, su he suffers a deadly wound and is severed from power. The rapture takes place, UFOs are blamed. Consequently, the beast blasphemes God, recovers from deadly wound, becomes world ruler. His recovery from the deadly wound is by becoming world ruler. That is how he recovers from the deadly wound he suffered at this, at this point, after he took the seed of Satan. Okay? So, he receives power to act for 42 months. So, remember that we are told in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, that the Antichrist, known as the wicked one, will show up only after the man of sin is revealed. So he's going to come after the man of sin is revealed. Has the man of sin been revealed? We have looked through a, a lot of things and you should be able to answer that for yourself. And after the revelation of the man of sin, uh, the next thing is the revelation of the wicked one. Has he been revealed? Okay, let's We've seen most of the scripture. We've seen most of the scripture. So if there is anyone that you know that you know fulfills all those conditions that we see in prophecy, the conditions and fulfills them, then think for yourself and know what you think about it. UFO files the classification. Forbes.com, Forbes magazine. Made a statement, they said 2021 is shaping up to be the year of the UFO. 2021 is shaping up to be the year of the UFO. That statement is, is pregnant. Okay, so what I know is I am telling you, I'm telling everybody, be ready for the coming of the Lord. Everything People, everything that you hold, everything that is of value to you now, everything that you have put above the word of God, everything you have put above the things of God, all those things will become nothing as soon as the rapture takes place. You will find out that all the money, all the gold and silver 
will become like rust, rusted in your hands after the rapture. Because they will make a rule that you cannot buy or sell except you take the mark of the beast. And you know that if you take the mark of the beast, your soul is doomed forever. Why do you have to wait until the rapture has taken place before you repent? Repent now and set your way right with God. Return to your first love. Return to your first love. The love of this world and the things of this world has displaced the first love in the hearts of many children of God. Return to your first love. Set things right. Seek the face of God with fasting and prayer. And let him restore the joy of his salvation to you. Now, according to Sports.com, in December 2020, a coronavirus relief bill was signed that included an interesting stipulation. The bill set into motion a 180-day time frame in which U.S. intelligence agencies must tell Congress everything they know about UFO sightings via an unclassified report. Now, I believe that, we, that what the current talk about UFOs is about is that humanity is being prepared for what's about to happen. Satan knows he cannot stop it. But he keeps trying anyway. He keeps trying. He's doing something. What are you doing as a child of God? What are you doing? Are you being wise? Are you being fruitful? What are you doing? A certain U.S. president, when asked about a new Pentagon task force for study UFOs, replied that he would look into it, and then began boasting about the power of the U.S. The US military. Some observers saw this as a threat to extraterrestrial beings. Okay? So, the rapture will be explained as aliens or UFO offensive against the earth. Revelation 13, 6 says, And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, and them that dwell in heaven. Because of this, he is made one world leader to tackle a common threat. Okay? Because of the rapture. He is made a one world leader to tackle a common threat. Revelation 37 says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. War against aliens and UFOs. This is going to continue even at the end of the seven year tribulation period. When all the nations of the earth are going to gather their armies together at Armageddon. Now, Revelation 19, 19 says, And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. So we see that this narrative of aliens and the rest of them will still be what they are going to use to deceive the, the world even at that time and gather their armies together. So what do we what do we know at this point? We know that the final secular king of Babylon will first appear as a friend of Israel before becoming her worst enemy. We know that he shows up not before but after the man of sin, or the false prophet, whom I believe to be Pope Francis. We know that he will occupy the most powerful position in the world and then suffer a deadly wound which disconnects him from power. He returns after the rapture to become world leader with an initial mandate to rule for 42 months. So, I believe we all have our suspicions or convictions, even at this point, about who this 
beast could be. If the person on your mind is the one, then perhaps you can understand that the rapture is possible any day now. So you may ask, what are you saying, Dr. Reich? What I'm saying is the same thing I said in the case of Pope Francis. There is fire on the mountain. There is fire on the mountain. Run, run, run. It is time for the church to arise and shine. The midnight cry has been going on for years now. I've noticed individual people coming up, you know, on, on social media to talk about the coming of the Lord. So, this message about the coming of the Lord is not new. And right now, within the past, who knows, say seven to eight years, it has gained an increased momentum, and there is a reason for it. It is the midnight cry. Jesus prayed for the attainment of fullness or completeness of the church and oneness through him with the Godhead. He says that they may be one. The midnight cry. He gave the assurance that there will be a midnight cry that will serve to awaken the church at the time of the end. He gave the assurance of the midnight cry. What we choose to do after we hear the cry is now our own business. What we choose to do will either place you in the category of the wise virgins or it will place you in the category of the foolish virgins. The wise virgins did something. The foolish virgins did nothing after they heard the midnight cry. Since the blood wounds of 2014 and 15, I have said that I have observed an increase in end time messages. And this is a sign that this is the midnight cry. All believers will not make the rapture. I have heard some men of God say that once you are a Christian, you will make the rapture. That is the greatest lie or one of the greatest lies I have ever heard. That is a lie against Jesus Christ, the Word of God Himself. No one will make the rapture just because he's born again. Because after you get born again and the fire of the Lord is lit, if you are not raptured instantly, over time you get there are things that could expose you. Okay, but Jesus said, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So, as time goes on after you get born again, there are the wind of iniquity blows left and right. The cares and of this world begin to pull at people, and you know, the love of this world, all these things begin to come and try to influence Christians. And sometimes, oftentimes, Many Christians are influenced by these things and taken away from the love of Christ. But they still go to church. They still take part in church activities, not knowing that they have departed from the tracks of the faith. Not knowing that they have departed from the tracks of the faith. Just like Samson, who, after he gave out his secret and his hair was shaved, when the Philistines came and he was told that the Philistines were there, he said to himself, I will arise and shake myself as before. But the Bible says that he knew not that the Spirit of the Lord had departed from him. Many Christians are coming to church, going about the church work, church business, and do not know that the Spirit of the Lord has departed from them. We need, the Bible tells us, Examine yourselves whether you are still in the faith. This is the word of God. Examine yourself whether you are still in the faith. So if the word of God says examine yourself, examine yourself. The rapture represents the harvesting of the earth for the eternal body of Christ. 
Dead seed, diseased seed, indeed, all unworthy seed will not be taken into the barn of this coming harvest. Conclusive membership in the eternal body of Christ is for those in, in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Those who love him and obey his commandments. It is not for them who are contented with religion or by mere external works of righteousness. Religion without relationship is like a body without a spirit. It is dead. The signs of the end are already, the signs of the end are, most of them I know of nothing that needs to be fulfilled anymore among all the signs of the end I have seen in the Bible. I know not of one thing anymore. And many and most of the recent signs were fulfilled in just a couple of years ago. Now, the Church of Jesus Christ needs to rally together around the theme of the midnight cry. Jesus is coming very soon. We need to be watchful, we need to be prayerful, and we need to be fruitful as Christians. We need to be watchful, that is, watch for his coming. We need to be prayerful, and we need to be fruitful. The branch that does not bear fruit shall be cut off and cast into the fire. You cannot appear before the Lord empty-handed. The Lord made an investment in your life. If you're a child of God, the Spirit of God is in you. The Spirit of God, by its nature, replicates. You need to deliberately keep him from replication. So, what have you done since you got to know Jesus Christ? Have you been sharing your testimony with people? Have you tried to bring other people who are not saved into the kingdom of God? If you have not done any of these, then it is possible that your own salvation could have a question mark on it. Why are you not preaching the gospel? Why are you not sharing the gospel? Especially today, that there are many avenues through which you can share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why are you not doing it? Are you ashamed of the gospel? If you are ashamed of the gospel, the Bible says that he will be ashamed of you. In other words, you will not be part of him. So, it does not end in the claim that I am born again. Faith without works is dead. So, the wise thing to do as a child of God is to resolve to take action. Now that you have heard all these things, now that you understand that the coming of our Lord is imminent, what is your plan? If the Lord will, will come and rapture his body in the next one week, what is your plan to be ready for him by the next one week? If he will come in the next three days, what is your plan so that you do not appear before him empty-handed? What is your plan? You must take, you must take steps to make sure that you are in right standing. You must take steps. Jesus commended the unjust steward in Luke chapter 16, verse 1 to 8, who was a fraudulent man that was told that the day of accounting was at hand. But because he took that message seriously, that the day of accounting, that he should prepare himself against the day of accounting, he took it seriously and he took measures to make sure that when that day came, even if he was sacked, that he would find a soft landing, he would find favor with the people that he used his master's wealth to gain favor with. And Jesus commended him, not because he was fraudulent, but because he took action. And Jesus said, for the children of this world are in their generation, in their category, in their own, in their own ranks, wiser than the children of light. However, I thank God that even as the parable of ten virgins uh, was given, that there were five wise virgins found. Will you be one of them? And I pray that you will be 
I pray that that will be also. And may the Lord help us all to make use, to allow these words that we have heard to sink into our spirits and to motivate us to take action and to repent when we need to repent and to get back to God in the mighty name of Jesus. If you are hearing and listening to this message and this teaching and you have not given your life to Jesus Christ, this is an opportunity for you. This is an opportunity for you. Jesus died for you. He died to save you from the sin of Adam. Yes, the sin of Adam put humanity, all of humanity, into the pit of sin. But Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the sinlessness of Jesus Christ, is the access by which anyone who believes can come out of that pit. Do you believe? If you do, say this prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I have heard your word. I repent of my sins. Thank you for dying for me and for rising on the third day. I open the doors of my heart. Come into my life. Come into my heart. And be my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name. Now, if you have prayed this prayer, I release you into the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And by the power of His Spirit, He will lead you in besides the streams of living water. He will lead you in the way that you should go. He will lead you to where you will receive the milk of the Word of God. He will receive, He will take you to places that you will receive the milk of the Word of God. And when you find your place in yourself in the wrong place, the Spirit of God will set off the alarm signals inside your heart and you will depart. May the Lord preserve you unto the day of his appearing in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you all for watching and listening. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.